Oops, did we not record that? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so what what I for those of you that watch the videos after um, that can't attend, what we were just talking about, Jennifer was sharing some concerns with Alex uh, and how it kind of can get in the way. So if you are working in Alex and have some things you want to share, some feelings about it and, and whatever, please send me an email. I know I've been really bad about responding to emails recently. Um, sorry, I think I've caught up. Uh, I'll say that it's difficult in Canvas to keep track of emails. And I just, it's my own fault because I haven't come up with a a good strategy to organize all that. But when you have emails coming in through Canvas and then through your school email, sometimes they get lost, mostly the Canvas ones, because Canvas's email system is not organized well. Okay, so uh, please feel comfortable sending me multiple emails and you can even get angry and I won't be uh, offended. Like, Eric, why haven't you responded, jerk? I sent this six months ago. Please respond, I pay you to respond. That really gets my attention. Although just sending it a second time with a, can you please respond to this works well too. Um, all right, so we're here we're finishing uh, unit three, which is great because that means we will be done with unit three before Thanksgiving break, which is not next week, but the following week. Um, and then after Thanksgiving break, we have unit four. It's a, it's a, a kind of a nice relaxing unit in many ways. And, um, oh yeah, Mike, I'm sorry. I meant to say, yes, 165 total objectives. You should be at 110 if you're on pace to do the amount per week. I forget how many we, we never, what's that calculation of objectives per week? Like when you look at 11 objectives per week, that's not too crazy. If you divide that by, let's say, a work day, you're looking at 2.2 objectives per work day. Um, and you could probably complete an objective. I don't know. You go, correct me if I'm wrong, in 10 to 15 minutes. So that's like 30 minutes a day doing Alex homework. But like Jennifer pointed out, if you get a diagnostic test that then wipes all that out, and then you have to start from ground zero. Go ahead, Jennifer, talk to me. Yeah, it just, it depends on how well you know it, because if you're getting them wrong, then it like bumps you down because you got to get it right like three to five times in a row before you can move on. So, I mean, for me, I'm at 137 and I've spent over 18 hours in Alex. So, so Jennifer, that's a lot of time. I, I've, had, I've had students that spent 40 hours. Yeah, see, no, no, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> now, listen, 18 hours in 10 weeks, that's not enough time. That's only it, like two funny. hours a week. That's like, what is that, 0.25 hours a, a day? So well, that's then you like have to think. <laughs> 15 minutes a day, that's it? But I'm I'm in class here for what, four hours a week? Listen, and, don't you know, listen to me. Don't listen to me. I know. It's just, it's, it can be a lot. And like, I get super frustrated by math really quickly. So it feels and, like forever for me too. Well, and then it's picky, right? Because you'll have, yeah. you'll have done it right, but you didn't round to how they wanted you to. And yep. yes, yes. No, those are all super valid critiques. I remember I was at the cutting edge of online homework for a physics class and I hated it. And I remember going in after an exam that I didn't do particularly well. And I asked Dr. Uh, was it Burdick? Dr. Burdick. He was this very serious man with a beard and like a pretty stereotypical physicist. And I was completely intimidated by him. I'm like, can you please reopen the online homework so I can redo it? And he just like had this exasperated sigh, like that homework is there for you to study for the exam. And of course I'd failed the exam pretty miserably. No, did I? I passed his class. I think I got a B, but that's why I stopped being a physics major. It was that. It was calculus-based physics. Okay, enough of those stories. Um, I want, what I, one of my main goals for this class is you, for you to leave it feeling like you can do math and that math is a useful thing. And Alex, from what you're saying, Jennifer, Alex undoes any of that. If, if you were all experiencing that with the content we cover. Um, my co-teacher and I, or my co uh lead instructor for this course 
um, are seriously considering what to do with online homework. So it's good information. Okay, here we go. Uh, so taxes. Um, do y'all know why we pay taxes? Let's see. Our author, what a what a jokester. I really enjoy paying taxes, said no one ever. Um, and then he's like, well, but really your taxes go for like the roads, except Michigan. We kind of don't remember to fund the roads sometimes. Although I guess this governor has been doing some work on that, right? If you live in Jackson, there's lots of work. Uh, funds the police, trash pickup. Does it fund trash pickup? I feel like I pay for trash pickup. Uh, firefighters, yes. Schools, yes. Not community colleges uh, here in Jackson. We don't, we haven't passed a millage in in years. Um, hey, it was election day yesterday. Does anyone know if the millage passed for Jackson? Did they, um, are, are we funding uh, an upgraded county jail? I forget. Or I haven't looked at that. Um, so there's a place that taxes are being levied. Um, and there's, of course, a bunch of different types of taxes. Property taxes often go to schools. So homeowners and business owners like who own the buildings pay these taxes that then fund the schools. There's sales tax that uh, typically are states sales tax. And then some income taxes. Do we have to? I think if you live in Jackson, the city of Jackson, don't you have to pay an income tax? I don't know. And then there's, of course, the federal taxes, which uh, tend to be the income tax. I think that's one of the main ways that the federal government is funded. And so it's if it's all the services of government that are funded by the taxes, plus the politicians, paychecks and all the rest. Um, and it's trillions of dollars, as as you saw in Project 2. Uh, OK, so let's talk about how the tax process works a little bit. I'm not a tax expert at all. And this is a really basic, simplified version of how federal taxes are calculated. So um, if you work for a large-ish business, um, or most businesses, they will withhold taxes for you and you fill out that, what is it, an I-9? No, it's a W-2 form where you decide, like, you decide how much taxes you want withhold from your paycheck. And basically what happens is you pay the government an amount of taxes that they owe based on all these different calculations. We're going to look at them based um, and they're related to tax brackets. And at the end of the year, you file and uh, it's kind of like the accounting process where there's an amount that you're required to pay in. And then if you paid in more, or you qualify for different tax credits, you get a refund. And if you didn't pay in enough, um, you have to pay more at a particular time. And that's what, what, April 15th is the typical due date for that tax filing. And then you can file extensions and there's all kinds of stuff. Um, the biggest thing, see, here's an example of a tax bracket, by the way. There's these categories. So you can be single filing just for yourself. You can be married and filing jointly. So you and your spouse are filing one tax return, or I guess a widower can file that, which would be, I think, to that widower's advantage financially. Or you could be married, uh, but filing separately, which is essentially the same thing as the single person. It is the same thing. It's just the two, the household has two people filing. And then you could also do head of household, and um, that's if you have dependents. So uh, this could be, um, I think typically what head of household would be used for is like someone who's divorced that has dependents, that has people other than themselves in the house. And it's actually um, to your advantage, I think, to file this way as opposed to single if you have uh, like children or um, other, other people that qualify as dependents. So in these categories, we have a tax rate based on the amount of money you earn, right? So you, you're charged 10% on your first $9,525 that you make as a single person. In other words, I would do 0 0.1 times 9,525, and I would owe the federal government $952.50. Now, the government doesn't do 
dollars and cents. So I think that they would round that to 953. But I'm going to round to the nearest cent. So here's where um, things get complicated, and that is that these are these income numbers are what we call the taxable income. And there's all kinds of ways to reduce your taxable income. The most common way is what the federal government does for everyone. You get a standard deduction and it's like $12,000. You just deduct from your income that you made for the year. And then that new amount is your taxable income. So it decreases the amount of your income that's being taxed at these different rates. If you make lots of money and you do all kinds of complicated things, there's a uh, itemized tax return that you can do where, you know, like you deduct your mortgage rent or you deduct business losses. I don't know if you remember the controversy about um, uh, President Trump's tax returns. And uh, he made a statement once or it, it came out that he had claimed like nine hundred sixty eight billion dollars of losses in one year's tax filing. And then that meant he didn't have to pay taxes for essentially the next 10 years, because when you you can offset your your tax income based on business losses. Um, that's just what he said. I don't know if the paperwork has ever been officially shown or whatever. I don't know. But that's an, that's a, an idea there of where you can reduce your taxable income. And that's the goal. Reduce your taxable income to as low as possible. So you pay the government the least amount of money. Um, Okay, so what we're going to do for this class is make an assumption. And we're going to, the assumption is, we're, or the calculations we're going to do are all based off of taxable income. And um, like in the project, I essentially have you, I have you do some reducing of that. But for the, for the worksheets and for here, we're just going to say someone is going to have this much taxable income. The reality is they're going to bring home a little more than that, um, but it's because it's so complicated, there's so many different rules that we're just not going to try to get into all that. So um, we're going to start here. What if we have a person filing as single? So we're in this column. By the way, these are outdated tax brackets. The ones in your worksheets, I think, are a little more updated. They sometimes change each year. These numbers change a little bit. Um, if you remember back in 2016-ish or 2018-ish, somewhere in there, um, the federal government passed a major tax bill, and these numbers were all changed. Um, and there was lots of debate. I don't know if you all remember that, about who benefited the most. The wealthy always benefit the most because they they have the most voice in who gets elected. Uh but it's still it still reduced taxes for for everyone across the board. So most people ended up paying less. Okay, so this person has a taxable income of forty two thousand. So what tax bracket is she in? So your job is to figure out where is forty two thousand in all these numbers. And the answer is right here. Forty two thousand is between thirty eight thousand seven hundred and eighty two thousand five hundred. So for the single filer, the maximum percentage of a portion of their income that they would pay is the 22%. They're not going to pay 22% of 42,000. They pay 10% of the first 9,000, 12% of the next amount, and then 22% of anything beyond that. But we often talk about this is the tax bracket this person's in. If this person had been married and filed jointly and the income of the married couple, the taxable income was 42,000, notice their tax bracket would have been lower. So married would have filed, would be the maximum percentage of a portion of their income would have been 12%. I hadn't noticed this before. I often said, oh, this is why we talk about marriage being advantageous in terms of a tax credit, um, but it's not necessarily true. It's These numbers are just doubled. Oh, they're not anymore. It used to be, some of these lower numbers are just twice, like, yes, 9,525 times two is 19,050. 38 times two, 77. 
82 times two is this. I believe this is that, this is that. But then here at the 35 level, it gets, um, it gets different. Okay, so um, our taxing is called a progressive tax thing. And that is um, we pay percentages of portion, different percentages of portions of our income as we go. So the author talks through here is like, well, if we just use the maximum times the 42,000, this is what we might think we owe on our taxes. $9,240. That's literally 22% of the taxable income. And for the married couple, they would owe $5,040 on their 42,000. Right? So this is this would be the taxes owed if it was just a flat tax uh, of your income. But what really happens is we get taxed at these different levels. So let me show you how that works. So for this, the single person's a little more interesting here. What you're going to do is take the 0 0.1 and multiply it times the 9,525. There's the 9,050. Then we're going to add to that. Well, so then we'll do, I'll put them separate first. Then we're going to do 12% of the amount of money they made over the 9,525 up to 38,700. So how much money did they make in there is the difference between those two numbers. So I'm taking this number and subtracting from it this number. In other words, they're getting taxed 12% of the $29,175 they made beyond their first $9,525. And they're going to owe this $3,500. Well, $3,501 on that amount of income. Then we get to the bracket they're actually in, and here we have to figure out how much money did they make over the 38,700? Well, they made 42,000. So if I subtract from that 42,000, this upper limit, the 38,700, we get the amount of taxes they're gonna owe on that. Let's get the actual amount of money that is. So they make $3,300 above or beyond 38,700. 22% of that 3,300 is 726. So their tax liability is a, is a term you might hear a lot, is um, the sum of these three taxed amounts. So 952.5 plus 3501 plus 726. Notice that's significantly less than the 9,240. How do you feel about that? Is everyone okay? This is actual taxes. So uh, I'll put under, I'll put in parentheses here. This is a progressive tax bracket, which is what we use. This would be a flat tax, which just everyone pays the same percentage. Okay, so let's do the same thing for the married couple. Let's see what is their actual tax liability. Um, so they owe 10% of 19,000, uh, oops, 19,050. And then I'm going to add to that 12% of whatever they make over that. So it's the 42,000 minus 19,050. So they actually owe $4,659. Note that the tax liabilities between the two are roughly the same. Now, if this uh, the thing to remember here is that this married couple, there are at least two people that have to live off of the forty two thousand, whereas this single person, there's only one person that you know that we have to buy food for and all the rest. So, is that maybe that's fair? Why the married couple pays a little less in tax than the other? I don't know. I don't know. All right. I'm going to give you a crazy practice problem. Grab your worksheets. And let's see if you can do this. Let me find my worksheet. 
This is not the one I want to open. I'm going to clean up my desktop. I also need some more coffee. I don't know about you all. Um, so here we are. This is the 2018 and 2017 tax bracket. So this is actually when the tax code changed. That big bill that got that got passed uh, in 2017, this is how taxes were calculated. And then in 2018, this is how taxes are calculated. So you can see um, the tax brackets changed. So they lowered taxes across the board, 37, 35, 32, 24, 22, 12, and 10. And then they also messed with these numbers. So um, they changed where people are taxed at. And these actually look really, oh, these are the same ones in the textbook. So notice I'm a complete jerk. I'm, I gave you a crazy problem. I want you to calculate the tax liability of a surgeon whose entry-level salary is this, and I want you to assume this is the taxable income. I guarantee that's not. I would guess that someone who makes this much money could could get their taxable income down, you know, by 50,000 probably and, and save a ton of money that way. But let's just assume this is what they're taxed on. So first question, what is the maximum tax bracket? What's the maximum percentage of tax that they're going to owe on a portion of their income? In other words, where is this number in these brackets? 33%. Okay, you're going to have to do one, two, three, four, five calculations. Note, I'm having you do it for 2017 and then for 2018. So you're going to do it twice. I encourage you to type this in Desmos, kind of like how I did it. You don't have to do it um, one at a time. You could do it all in one line. Uh, where, did I, where did I do it? Uh, yeah, like right here. You could do it like this one. And then you can see where, if you'd made a mistake somewhere or whatever. So try that. I'm going to give you five minutes to do A, and then we'll check our answers together, okay? Would, would we do different parentheses for each time we're subtracting something? Yes, because you okay. want that percentage times the difference. That's a really good point. And it's always the numbers you're subtracting are always this upper number minus the previous upper number, not the in between. Otherwise, you're not paying on one dollar of taxes. Because he's too okay. dumb to run away. Set a time. Set a timer for five minutes.
How are we doing? Y'all get the 2017 one? So the part that most student, the one of the more common mistakes I make. Oh, I'll go. Oh, sorry, Mike. I'll, I'll let me highlight what most students. One of the common mistakes is that is when you get to the last bracket, where the taxable income is at. Students often forget to put in the income. So at the thirty-three percent. We're taking the taxable income, which is this 195, 670, and subtracting from it the previous maximum, 191, 650. So this is what I get, and this is how it's all written out. And I'll pause here and let you all check it. Um, so this is the 2017 tax liability. Nice. Yikes, right? That's a ton of money. $47,000? Like, that's the median income in Jackson County. That's Actually, that's probably more than the median income. Let me just see. Median income, Jackson, Michigan. Okay. it's Oh, that's nice. This is up since last time I checked. So it's close to the median income of Jackson County or Jackson, Michigan. Um, again, remember, this is assuming that the taxable income is 195670 I'm just going to, when you do these problems, you all, um, it's I it's okay to write out. It's good to write out all your work, like what you typed into Desmos. Um, it's also okay not to, just don't make a mistake. Okay, where's everyone at? Does anyone need more time before I show the 2018 one, or are we good? Okay, okay, let's see. I think I probably agree. That does look very familiar. So, um, yes, it's not, it's not, well, it, it, look at me being picky about the word equation. Yeah, it's just the expression. It's just the each bracket being calculated out. You can do it se separately if you want. Like how much taxes do you have to pay at the 10% amount, how much do you have to pay at? So, so if you look through, this is the 10% amount. Here's the 15% amount. Here's the 25% amount, the 28% amount and the 33% amount. Yeah, it's much easier to type it in this way instead of doing each piece, I totally agree. And if you're using your little uh, iPhone or your uh, a regular little calculator where you can't see it all typed out, oh, heavens help you, right? Like that's, you just better be perfect when you type it in. Um, 
one of the things I've heard people who work in HR departments that have to mess with these taxes is that they have tax brackets where this difference is calculated. Because these numbers are the same. Every time you do a tax calculation, the only one that's going to be different is where the taxable income is. So if we were doing a 2017 tax liability for someone who made 50,000, let's say, or the median income, what, 54, 511, um, we would be putting this one as 54, 511, and this number is exactly the same. So, I don't know. It's just different ways that that people who have to deal with this, people who work in businesses where they have to calculate the amount of taxes to withhold and all that mess. It's just different ways they, they deal with that. Okay, so um, one of the reasons I wrote this worksheet back in the day is to have people compare, hey, what actually happened when that tax law was uh, written into law and the tax code changed? How much does this person save? So if you look at page two, I said, what's the difference in taxes owed from 2017 to 2018? Now, if you remember how to calculate difference or change, it's new minus old. Why am I doing this for you? Take a few minutes and see if you can't do these calculations. This is unit one stuff. Let me do five minutes on the clock and let's see how you do. Set a timer for five minutes. Use Desmos too, it's just a beautiful thing.
Nice. So. There's your difference. So for this particular scenario, the new tax code saved this individual $3,666.45 in tax. And so what was the percent change? So that's this new minus old. If you're forgetting that, it's new minus old divided by old, right? And then that's a percentage, so you multiply it by 100. So I just need to take this thing and divide it by the original amount, 47970.35. Um, you must have done it the other direction, Allison. Is that, I said Allison, Alyssa, sorry. I get negative 0 0.0764. No worries. Um, what you would say then is that it was an 8.3% in, in increase from 2018 to 2017, which is weird because it's time travel. Oops. Um, oh, come on. Uh, control C, there we go, Control V. Let me just confirm that that's what happened. Um, be this minus 44, 303.9, and then, and then control C, control V. Yeah, there it is. So uh, it's not, uh, Alyssa, it's not an incorrect calculation. Uh, it's just when you interpret it, you would have to write a thing that sounds weird. Um, so from 2018 to 2017, it was an 8.27 eight percent increase in taxes um excellent i, I got that i got that um but negative i got 8.3 negative percent so i think i'm not sure if i calculated it right either let me see let me change it how did you how does it um did you do the 44303.9 minus 47970.335 um, and, 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 I did, yeah, 44, 303 minus 47. Did you divide by 47 or 44? I divided by 44. Okay. So that, that one is wrong because what you divide by has to be the same thing you're subtracting by. Otherwise you're, you're getting a percent of a different thing. Is it um, new minus old divided by old? Yes. So, oh, you're okay. I got you. I see what I did. Good, good. Which, like, just in case the rest of you are wondering, it's really the 2018 value minus the 2017 value divided by the 2017 value. That's like the the most correct way to do it. Um, but what Alyssa did was the 2017 value minus the 2018 value divided by the 2018 value which gives you a mathematically accurate result. It's just a wacky interpretation. It's a, it's a going back in time interpretation. Although another way to, you could say that the 2017 taxes are 8.28% higher than the 2018 uh, taxes. That's one way, one option. Cool, okay. Um, there's one last thing we need to talk about in this section and then we're, we're done. Can you believe that? Um, and that is, or one last thing I'd like to show you, that is the effective tax rate. All right. So um, let me write some things in Desmos and we're going to talk about this in Desmos. I'm going to get rid of these percent changes and I'm just going to make a note here. Let me zoom out just a smidgen and say this, the effective tax rate is the tax liability divided by the taxable income. Um, essentially, this is like the flat tax rate. In other words, it's the flat tax you paid. Or, or another way to say it is the percent, whoops, not five, percent of your income 
of taxable income paid in taxes. This is to I think for most people, this is the most important number uh, for planning purposes. Uh, because once you get all your deductions and you get down and you know your taxable income, you can do all these taxable tax bracket things. You can say, well, this is how much I'm going to pay. But what percent of your income are you paying? So for the 2017 uh, income or tax thing, we would take the 47,970.35. That's the amount of taxes they owe and divide it by that person's taxable income, the 195,670. So in 2017, the the effective tax rate was 24.52 percent. I'll write that. In 2017, the surgeon paid 24.52 percent of their taxable income as taxes to the federal government in this case. So then what happened in 2018? Assuming that um, person made the same amount of money, which uh, if you remember what was going on, not too many people were getting raises, although I wouldn't have been surprised if a surgeon gets a raise, a raise a raise, <laughs> then in 2018, whoa, whoa, easy big spender. There we go. So then in 2018, the surgeon is paying 22.64% of their taxable income. Now we can look at like how much change really happened for this particular individual in terms of the percent of their income they had to fork over to the government. And that's just the difference of these two. So they had a one, almost 2% decrease in tax and uh, in, in taxes paid by their income in their income. So you can look at this and you can think through all these numbers and you can think about like, if you're a politician trying to get reelected which of these numbers are you going to use? Like if you voted for the tax bill, which of these numbers are you going to report to the Republic, uh, Republic to the public to say, hey, look at how good this tax bill was that I that I passed for you all. Look, I decreased the amount of taxes you owe by 7.64 percent. Vote me back in because I'm going to keep trying to do that. Right. Or maybe someone's like, well, you Really, they only decreased a percent of your income that's taxed by 1.87%. Um, right, yes, I would be saying the 7% for sure. Um, or or you could say, hey, look, the previous government charged 8% more taxes than the new government that I was a part of that voted in, right? And the fun thing is each one of those numbers is mathematically correct. And that's where... Uh, as a math instructor, what I want you all to learn is how to be intelligent consumers of information. Like, really, if a politician was all about honesty and truth, and we talk about, like, really what's going on, we would share each one of these numbers and talk about how they affect, uh, how it affects each person, and what it all means, and here's a complete picture of what happened. Whereas instead, you know, you can't blame the politician, right? They're just, they're trying to keep their job. You highlight the good things you did and ignore the bad things you did. Minimize those, um, which feels like you're being misled, right? <laughs> and in some cases. Um, okay, uh, that's it for uh, taxes for Section 3.6. That's really all I cover here. Um, let's do the lesson check before I forget, because I will 100% forget. Um, and I believe we didn't actually do it. Let's see. Let's find out what it is. Why don't I go to assignments? Oh, I have an email to respond to. See, there's, there it pops up. Uh, lesson 3-6, check. No time limit. Multiple responses, no. Ugh. 
Get it right, or you're going to have to do it wrong. Calculate the amount of tax. Question three on page 348. So that is going to be one, two. You use the tax bracket to cut kind of, uh, the 2018 table. Okay. So this is the, I believe, the uh, $5,179.50. $5, Let me just double check. Um, what I just typed that in. 5179.50. And then maybe I don't have to click around and figure out if it's right. Dun, 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 dun. Wrong. It's the wrong answer. Oh, my bad. We have to do it for someone paying 25300 filing joint so let's quick get that calculation that's the problem so let's go back to our tax bracket here and the twenty five thousand filed jointly is going to be here so we're going to do 0 0.1 times 19,050 plus 0 0.12 times the 25,300 minus 19,000 50. So they're going to owe 2655. That's the correct answer. Um, let me write that down in here. So the 3.6 lesson check, oh, they had it right here, is 2655. Can I, can I retry it? Oh, look, there's the correct answer. Maybe you can see it now. Uh, let me fix it just in case you all did put in the answer, the wrong answer and need to do it again. Allow multiple attempts. Thank you very much. Is that good for everyone? Okay. Good. Um, should we chat about the tax part of pro of project three? Yes, we should. Yeah. I'm sorry. Ahead. What was the check again? It is uh, two thousand six hundred fifty five dollars. That's the amount of taxes that Mr. and Mrs. Brown, who are filing a joint return and have twenty five thousand three hundred dollars of joint tax um, that they owe. Uh, I kind of skipped over that you can use the table that says if you make between this amount, this is how much you would you would owe. Married married filing jointly, and so it's three dollars more based on the table. So if this is how you did it, you would get a three dollar refund from the government. Um, Okay, um, project. Let's chat about the project here. Uh, I should mention, how's everyone doing with the midterm? Did anyone retake it? I haven't even looked. I have not retaken it. Um, here in a minute, uh, I was going to ask if maybe you could show me how to do log mode. And... Finding out the slope and, and those things on um, Desmos. Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, so, excuse me. First, let's, let's just chat about the project. Just a reminder, here you're picking the car. One of the things that um, is unfortunate is question five. It isn't clear about the... Um, which of these loans you're going to pay off early. So just pick one. Pick one of the lengths. You don't have to do all three. One oh. of the term lengths. Unless you I already did them all. Three. Okay. Sorry. Was, I mean, it's not, quick. It, it's not, it didn't take long. It's, okay, then don't listen to me and just do yeah. all three. Because it's control C, control C, control C, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, 
Here is the taxable income. I grabbed it for 2022. Uh, remember, you get to decide if you're going to file single versus married. Notice it's a little different than the one that's in the book. They upped the, the maximum for the 10%. Looks like the percentages are unchanged. Uh, it looks like they maxed all of them a little bit, which essentially reduces the taxable income a, a little bit. Um, so pick whichever one you want. doesn't matter to me, any one of these three. Just make sure you state it. And uh, remember, your the idea here in my head is that you find um, the median entry level income of the job you're heading towards. You don't have to find entry level. Um, you could go for the median salary. So, like, what is the middle salary of this um, of this job you're headed towards because of the degree you're getting here? Um, or you could head for the maximum just to see the my goal kind of here at the end of this is to say, hey, is it worth going to college to get this degree from a financial standpoint? That is not the only consideration you should make um, when when doing uh, when picking your job, in my opinion, but whatever. Now, notice I also gave you the standard deduction. So what that means is if you go out and want to be a surgeon, like what's on the worksheet, and you find that your salary is going to be 195000 and you choose to take the standard deduction, you're going to reduce that taxable income by this amount. So you're going to subtract that. So make sure you do this and note that the vast majority of Americans do take the standard deduction. The vast majority of wealthy Americans do not. They itemize because it's better for them. Or they hide their money in offshore accounts. You know, whatever. So so uh, make sure you do that and then run through the calculations like we just did. What I would love for you to do is submit this to me. Like this entire Project 3 you can do in Desmos. Just make sure when you do the paragraph writing, like the, the analysis questions, like here, comparing the pros and cons, um, which down payment would you, that's an incomplete sentence. Did I delete something? Yeah, for that, I just picked which down payment I would choose and why. <laughs> and why, okay, yikes. Oh, let's pretend I'm not the one that wrote this this project and pretend I'm really good at proofreading. Um, yes. So make sure if you're doing these things in Desmos that you don't just write a single tiny little sentence. I'm I'm more in, I'm almost as interested in your answers to this as your answer as your calculations. But please do use Desmos. It's a, just such a nice tool. Um, OK. Any questions on the project? Is anyone kind of stuck on it on anything? Or are you feeling good about that? Okay. Um, to those of you that are not excited about this exam, one word of encouragement is that, and I probably shouldn't say this out loud, it's only 10% of your grade. So it's not going to fail you in the class. If you don't turn on a project, you're going to fail the class. Um, almost without a doubt. I don't think I've had any. I've had lots of students that don't turn on projects. In fact, right now, about half of my 60 students have turned nothing in, um, which blows my mind. But I I also know that people have lives and things and um, whatever. Uh, so don't fret too much. Just do your best. Um, do your best to remain calm and relaxed. And I'm hopeful that the video recording doesn't make you more nervous. Don't worry. I don't really watch it. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes when I'm grading, I see some suspicious answers, like people have the exact same sentence written. And then I'm like, oh, now maybe I have to go look at the video and see if I can see that they were texting each other the answers or whatever. And um just just do your best and you'll be fine even if you fail it you'll be fine um anything is better than a zero um okay so we're gonna get to mike's question about um 
regression modeling. But does before we do that, does anyone have any questions about the chapter three project or the three six stuff? All right. So I do have a quick question now that I'm looking at it. Um, yeah. For the purchase, the stock thing, it says like the fee free brokerage app. So like how, what app would I use or where would I find that? Oh, on? that's such a great question. Uh, the point there is that you're not paying a commission. Okay. That's all it is. Um, there are tons of apps like Robinhood is one, uh, um, there's a bunch of different places where you can buy them. You don't, you don't even need to use that. You're just going to go find us. Well, you're going to take the stock that you used for project two as your day zero and see how many shares can you buy. Oh, okay. And this is just saying, don't charge yourself a fee for purchasing it. Okay. So we're using what we used for project two day zero, that price. You can pick another one if you want, but just go back in time. The, what So what I want to happen, what I want you to see is like, if you purchased this 10 weeks ago or five yeah. weeks ago and then sold it today, would you have made money? Okay. And I'm forcing you to sell it at a, like you have to pick a day that you're selling it, which you might not do it because you lost money. You might hang on to it. That's some of the psychology of investing. Like, when should I sell? Like, that was what was going on with the GameStop. People were like riding the curve and like, oh, it's going to get more. I'm going to hang out to get more and more. And then it like dropped and they lost tons of money and they could have been millionaires and then they weren't. Same thing with Bitcoin. Ooh. That hmm. one's very volatile. All right. That's cool. Thank you. You are most welcome. And and don't fret about Alex. Yeah. Spend 15 minutes and do what you can and then move on. Yeah, I'm going to do a bunch of it tomorrow while I'm waiting at clinical. So, See, that sounds like fun. <laughs> it's not the most fun, but it makes the time pass. Hey, it's better than scrolling the infinite TikToks, right? Oh, we can't have our phones on us, so we don't get that option. So. Oh, wait, clinicals? Oh. Yeah, can't even have our smartwatch. Oh, man, they are hardcore. Yep. Is that true, like, when you're a nurse as well? Do you know? I uh, know, like, all of them. Because I'm going to school for x-ray. Um, okay. They, yeah, they all have their phones and their watches. It's just some students from a few years ago abused it. So now we're in trouble for them. So every corporal punishment. Gotta love it. Yep. 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 Okay, cool. Um, so Mike, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, based on what you said, I think what you're wanting to see is a data set that we then calculate a linear and exponential regression model from it. Is that correct? Yes. I'm not sure where to um, where to be able to type in the equation and then be able to get the log mode and all of those things for the exam because like the last part of the exam i missed like five or six or seven questions because they were all on this data set i was like oh no okay so let me get to the worksheet and we'll just we'll just grab one of the data sets there um here this isn't a data set we really didn't no that that's not that's not a data set let's grab we'll go to the two one worksheet is this a good no no we don't want to do that one Where's that? This one right here. Okay. So the debt and the per month monthly payment. Um, so yeah, there was a couple places. There's really three places on the exam that you could do this. Um, so what you are doing, uh, this is page, if you want to look at your own stuff, this is page 19. So when I give you a data set and I say, find a regression model or find an equation of best fit or whatever, the first thing you do is hit the plus sign and table. And you pull this up in Desmos. And then of course you type in your numbers. Don't do commas. Desmos doesn't like commas. Ugh, that's a million, whoops. Okay. 
I'll pause there. You let me know when you got your data in. Uh, the rest of you, if you don't need to see this, you don't need to stay here. If you don't want to, you're welcome to stay here. I'm happy for you to hang out. But I just want to make sure you know uh, I've covered everything I'm going to cover for new material. Okay, it might take me a second. I'm going to pull out my phone and do Desmos. On yeah, phone. take your time. I'm I'm happy to wait. While we're waiting on that, Alyssa, do you? Here's a chat. Um, okay, Jennifer, have a great day. Alyssa, do you have any questions? Totally fine if you don't. Uh, no, I just wanted to see this too. I had the same question. Oh, good. Wonderful. So you chime in when you've got it in there too. And it's not a race. You all take okay. your time. Especially if you're typing in a phone. That takes forever. I'll just do push-ups or something. So I think we've got it here. I don't want to rush you, Mike, but maybe you did you say while I was gone that you're good or are you still typing? Yep, I got mine uh, typed okay. in here. Awesome. So first, I'm going to type in the linear model, also known as the linear regression equation or just the model. Those are the different words. I forget the language on the midterm, but it was something like that. So what we do is we note these variables up here. And that's what we're going to use. And then remember that the equation is, generally speaking, y equals mx plus b. So we're just going to use these labeling so that Desmos knows to pick these values when, they, when it does the regression. So y hit 1, and it automatically does that subscript. And then since I know you're using your phone, at least, Mike, you're using your phone, you're going to click this keyboard or keypad thing and then go to the ABC part and use this tilde button. It's also shift the button above tab. What is that? Apostrophe? I don't know. And then you're going to keep typing in M X1 plus B. There's the linear model in all its glory. Notice this is the exact model. This is exactly a line. In fact, if we, I don't know why I don't have this full screen. If we do the zoom fit thing, you can see that every single one of these data values are on that line. So this is the best model. But uh, that's not always the case. 
Sometimes they're sort of close, but not exact. And that's the point of doing this. So let me pause there and make sure you all are, let me know if, when you have this in your thingy. So I've got that typed in and it, it does pull up the R value and the M and B values too. Perfect. Now, the exponential model, generally speaking, is this thing, y equals a, b to the x. Now, we, we, if you got this result, you would be done. You wouldn't need to type in the exponential model because it's not going to, if the linear model is perfect, the exponential model will not be. But your job in the project two and on the exam was to determine which one is it. So you type in the same thing, y1 tilde, but this time you put in the exponential equation, a, b raised to the x1, and you should get all this. And then this is where, Mike, what you're referring to, the log mode, you've got to click this so that we can compare the r values directly. And it's the reason what's happening is the calculator is using a slightly different method for generating these parameters for finding the equation, whether you're in log mode or not. So what we've done in class is always use log mode so we can directly pick compare between the two. This R value is good. 0.9264 is a good model, but it's not the best because R is exactly one. Let me know when you got that. I've got that. And and the the best one is going to be the one closer or two or is exactly one. Right. Closest to one or exactly one or negative one if it was decreasing. Yeah. Okay. Alyssa, how about you? Are you good with this? I think so. Um I maybe I'm wrong, but in the uh midterm, I think I was confused because we didn't have like a table already. To like type in so does it still work without having a table correct it does not so there are two types of problems on the midterm right there's ones where i give you a data set and you have to write the equation and there's others like on the review where well that's not the review where i give you information about a and b or m and b and you have to write the model yourself which is what one of the things i before we move on to that, actually, you need to be able to take this thing and write it. So the correct answer here, um, if you were to write down the equation rounded to, say, two decimals, you would do y equals the m, 0 0.01, times x plus 0.15. That is the model, if I said, find the model, round the parameters to two decimal places. If it was the exponential model, you would write y equals 88.71 times one point. In this case, you have to put in all the values. 0, 0, 0,03 raised to the x value. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I'm good so here. This, yep. And, and then, then I ask questions later that says, well, if x is 17, what is y? Really, I say, if your uh, if the amount you borrow is two hundred thousand, what will your monthly payment be? And that's for if you do something like f of x, what we did um, is we said f of two hundred thousand. So here we're using the model now, and your monthly payment would be two thousand dollars a month. That's how much you borrow. And the other things we did was like interpret the slope, interpret the y-intercept, interpret um, the growth factor, that kind of thing. Go ahead, Mike. So yeah. if I do, so if I have to find a y value or an f of x value, I have to first type in the equation, right? Yes, yes, most definitely. And can I see uh, that equation again? Mm, yes. <laughs> Note, I'm pulling the the numbers here, the parameters, from what it says the parameters are. And notice I know where to put them based on the letters. The M is multiplied times the X. The B is added. 
and then down here they're just multiplied together. And B, um, one of the so, other tricks. Go ahead. Um, one thing, if if I was trying to find out what a x value is when when it's a y when I have a y value, how do I do that? So um, it's one way you can just straight use Desmos. Um, and that would be like, what if, what if we wanted to know um, how much, if, if our payment is, um, if our monthly payment is 1500 a month, what is going to be the amount we would borrow? So you just type in Y equals 1500. And I've got my, uh, let me hide this. I've got my, the green equation is the exponential. The blue equation is the linear. And I go over to my graph and on the exponential one, it says we can borrow 94,263. For the linear one, it says we would be borrowing 149,985. So notice I just typed in Y equals the number you're solving that you're given and I'm finding the X value on the graph where the two things intersect. For exponential, this is the only way you're gonna be able to solve it. For linear, you could literally write 1500 equals this and then subtract 0.15 divide by 0 0.01 and you'd get it. So all I have to do is type in Y equals and then the value and then it, it's it's gonna give me those two points. That's awesome. Okay, yeah, cool. You just have to click them or touch them. Sweet. Nice. Yeah, I love Desmos. Like, you don't have to know any algebra. You just do it graphically, which is an algebraic. It, it is part of algebra, but it's often not emphasized. Um, okay, so Alyssa, your question, uh, like, here's, this is a type of question you might face where we give you this prompt and we're like, hey, write the linear equation. You don't have a data set, so you can't use use what we just did. What you would have to do is understand what M and B represent. Remember, M is the slope, which is a rate of change. And B is the y-intercept, also known as the initial value. So for this particular problem, we were given a one-time bonus of 16,000. That's the initial value. And then we're paid at a rate of 25,000 each year. Well, whatever this is. So this equation is just taking that information, figuring out what's what and writing it. There's that one. And then another one down here is like, hey, we're gonna give you, not this one. This one, you anytime we give you a data set, you can use what we just did in Desmos. This one here, we gave you the model and you have to find the stuff from it. And then, uh, here's another, seriously, where, where are the other ones? There's another one here somewhere. I hate how slow my computer is. No, oh, there isn't another one we had to write the model on this review. I think there was one in the that we did together in class not there. Ugh. Not that one. Nope, there wasn't another one. There is one in the worksheets. We could go down, we could go back to the chapter two worksheets. There were a couple in there. Um, so here's another linear one. And then here's here's an exponential one. You have 500 invest for 10 years. You find an investment that pays 15% interest. That's a rate. Is this helping at all? Listen, I'm just like talking and I don't know if, <laughs> if it's useful. Yeah, it's helping. Okay. Um, did you get a chance, I don't know if you were there or saw the write-up for the, the review write-up. Do you know what I'm talking about? The reference, the reference sheet I suggested. Uh, I don't think I saw that. So I'll pull it up from the YouTube channel. Do you know how to get to the YouTube videos? 
did I did I do yeah. that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. Good. So it would have been now that they're labeled. You might have been the one that asked me to do that. Um, the ten nineteen is the day we did the review. And let's not listen to me talk because that's oh good lord. Look at that face. Um, make it small, please. Um, good. We don't have to see me anymore. Somewhere in here, I swear I did a write up. Yeah, here we go. So right around pay, uh, minute 851, I started writing. Jeez, is it already done? Where is it? Ugh, this is like watching paint dry. I feel so bad for all of you that have to watch the videos. Somewhere in here. Um, Okay, there I wrote it at some point. I just can't find where it was. Um, oh, here it is, around minute seventy. Here it's here it's filling up. Um, so I I write out here's the exponential, the linear. Th this is where I'm like, hey, this is what you should have when you sit down for the exam. A reference sheet that looks like this for for all of the questions from unit two. And uh, I'm defining all the things. I don't know how helpful it is. Uh, here we go. Um, we go back one. There's like this whole, there's what the A's and B's and how you can write it in function notation. Oh, it just looks beautiful now when I'm looking at it, even though it's off of the watch. And I did the same thing for unit one, the unit one review, where I wrote up, here's all the stuff you should have on a sheet um, to help you work through the midterm. We'll do the same thing for the final for units three and four. Look at all that useful information. Just beautiful. Like here's everything you need for Desmos. The Y1 tilde, that, check the log mode, look at the correlation coefficient. Okay, I can stop. Um, what are the questions you'll have? How else can I help you? I think I'm good uh, after that. That will help too, to be able to find the uh, the reference sheets for sure. Good. You can have like four pages of stuff written down. And I think I did, even though I still didn't do so great on the exam, I did better than I originally thought because um, I guess it wasn't graded. I, right. I, when I, I went like a B or whatever, but at least I was passing kind of. <laughs> when I went and looked at how it grades, any question that I had to grade, it counted it as a zero. So like it auto grades all the stuff it can auto grade and then it gives you how many you got correct out of all the total points. And I have to like manually grade at least half the exam. So everyone got an F right away. Um, I don't know how to change that. I don't know if I can. So don't ignore your grade until I grade it. Because um, it will happen again. Unless I can figure out how to fix it. Cool. All right. Well, I'm I'm good. Um, cool. Have a good day, and thank you for uh, thank you. helping out. Happy to help. I'm good too. Thank you. You are welcome. Crush it, y'all. Thank you.